You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, God damn it! Get the point good. And now... Fend Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. <laughs> so what'd you think of my lead-in? Oh, my goodness. Oh, I heard that on the radio and I thought, gosh, do I have that? I think I have that somewhere in my musical repertoire. <laughs> I just had to do that. Hell, <coughs> Got me all choked up. I may just have to keep that as my intro song. That's just too funny. (laughs) The only thing that would be better would be like uh, the monkeys. Um, Here they come, walking down the street. Oh, good Lord. It is a wacka, 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 wacka doodle Wednesday, and I am your hostess with the most of something. I haven't figured out what yet. But yeah, I am Grammy Mary, and I'm here to, to mess with your head just a wee bit. What is that, Frumpy, that you just shared? Oh, my Lord. There's no way to stop the lava. People have tried, hun. <laughs> Oh, man. You know, that's what happens when you live on an island that was created by a volcano. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Dang it. I was out in the wind today, so yeah, I, I'm I'm hacking, wheezing, coughing. I need to stop doing that on Wednesdays, don't I? In any case, uh, yeah, um, when you live on an island that has an active volcano, you're going to have lava. Just saying. And then when you go, I don't understand why it ruined my house. Don't build close to a volcano. Pretty simple. But the view. Yeah, well, you got a hell of a view now, don't you? There you go. I know. I sound so heartless, don't I? But it's it's one of those things where it's like, duh. You know, it's like those people in California that build on uh, cliffs. And then they have mudslides, and their house is gone, and they're sitting there just sobbing. We've lost everything. Well, that's what happens when you build on the side of a cliff. Okay? Because Mother Nature always wins, because she's bigger and badder. You know, it's kind of like out here. If uh, a donator come through and, and took out everything I had, it'd be like, well, I still have my critters. That's a good thing. Nobody in the house got hurt. That's a good thing. The rest of the shit is just shit. And I guess I'm not going to have to dust it anymore. (laughs) I mean, that's kind of a weird way of looking at it, but mm, they're things, people. And if nobody gets hurt, that's the main thing. But if you get hurt by trying to stop lava, thank you for cleaning the gene pool. Mm. Yes, I have to find a funny side to just about everything just about there's a few things that I just can't find a funny side to but that's that's one of those where it's like oh darling please do not whine to me I will give you cheese and crackers and that's about the extent of it when you give me your wine okay let's see I gotta say hi to everybody cuz yeah I'm what is this antibacterial development company mm-hmm, mm-hmm. oh Eliminate bacteria in meat. Yummy. Sounds like eliminate flavor. No, don't go there. That's from UCY TV over here on Twitter, by the way. I have 407 stockos, stockers. Yay! I lost some, I gained some. I lost some, I gained some. I bet you dollars to dog turns. I'll lose some more again because I have a tendency to um, mm, off-end people from time to time. Go figure. <laughs> Uh, okay, no, nope, no, nope, that's not. No, nope, no, nope. I'm trying to, I'm trying to retweet while I'm trying to say hi. <laughs> so I'm trying to type t- hiya, and 
Hiya, 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 hi. Yeah, I'm not doing real good. Okay. Hi, Twitter. Thank you, Barman, for tweeting me out. I truly do appreciate it. Yeah, major escalation. Israel retaliates. Why is it that Israel is considered retaliating when they started the shit in the first place? I don't understand. You guys just really mess with my wee little brain sometimes. Oh, well. Bye-bye, Twitter, because y'all are making me crazy. What? Oh, Dick's Sporting Goods. I saw Dick's, and it's like, whoa. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I'm going to close Twitter before I get in trouble. Okay. Um, over here on Freedoms Network. Thank you, Grimner, for sharing me over here on Freedoms Network. I also see the lovely Estrellas here, as well as Mental Pancakes. And Pancakes shared this. Uh, did you know Kansas City welcomes 25 million visitors anally? Ow. Flash, honey, did you spend time in uh kc for some reason because you're always talking about you know how they want to bend you over and ram it up your poop shoot uh just asking i also see katie troxel's been here as well as bobby bain so yeah several people over here and by the way may 23rd please consider donating to help with the um server fees over here on freedoms network it would be truly appreciated there's a wonderful donate to freedoms network button on the left hand side you can't miss it it's red and it says donate to freedoms network do it you know you can okay over here on fakie book i don't see a whole i don't see a whole hell of a lot of anything going on on fakie book seriously i mean i turned it off this morning and i came back from town and running errands and all of this other fun stuff and turn the computer on for the, getting stuff ready for the radio and nothing nothing on um fakey book it's like what the hell okay here's a really cool article but it's on forbes.com and forbes.com keeps wanting me to uh whitelist them and i'm not going to whitelist them so i'm just going to tell you the headline real quick report total marijuana demand tops ice cream in u.s booyah bonus round one is good for you one no longer is you know unless you make it at home with ingredients that you know exactly where they came from ice cream is not necessarily good for you no more let's see um Yes, they do, Moosey. They do it to us every day figuratively. <laughs> I wish they'd quit it because my backside itches when they do that stuff. It's like, dang it, guys, cut that out. Oh, hey! <laughs> <laughs> my cousin, what a Fruit Loop. He uh, moved all of his plants outside apparently today and uh, he had his spouse take a picture of him. And so he's outstanding in his field. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You are such a dork, Gary, but I love you. Okay, not a, not a whole hell of a lot going on on Fakie Book. Over here on Mines, wow. Mines has been a little on the, hmm, and why do you keep changing to subscribed? I want it to be top. I don't want it to be there. Okay. Yeah, Mines is busy too, but hi, Mines. How you doing? Hope you're having an awesome day if you're over here on Mines. Uh, yes. Yeah, I know. I'm completely spacing the greetings. <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah. <laughs> to a scam org? Oh. Oh, man. I know. Moosey, I, oh, I don't, I don't do any of those anymore. You know, unless I can give um, directly to the individual that I know it's going to go to. And most of the time, if I'm going to donate to someone, especially if they've got youngins, I just go buy them groceries. You know, because it, it saves them money. They don't have to go and buy food. And, uh, yeah, they get something, and I feel better because now I know at least their children can eat. And that money that they're getting, or, you know, if I were to give them money, because, you know, some of them, huh, I don't necessarily know how they would spend their money, and I may not be pleased with the way they spend their money. So I buy groceries. 
That's what I do. Okay. Uh, oh, you guys must still be talking about um, the volcano over in Hawaii. She's just having a good time. Dropping all kind of stuff. Okay. Now, if you wish to give me static, if you're listening right now, because right... Because, yeah, if you are, it's probably on reallibertymedia.com, channel 3. But you might also be listening in on the Spreaker channel. And if you are, you need to come on over to reallibertymedia.com and think of a nickname and join the chat and give me some static and I'll give it back. And then the rest of the chat will give you static and you give it back and then you'll just be like well, one of the family. <laughs> That's the way we work over here. So, over here... Um, you you never answer I answer my phone when it's someone I know if I don't recognize the number it don't get answered period and if they don't leave a voicemail obviously they did not wish to contact me too bad so over here in the RLM right up top I see Barman the most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world uh, Grimner is also here as well as Grimner 9 damn double dose of Grimmy booyah that's because he's so busy he needs to do the whole multiplicity thing and have a clone to help him out and looky there the lovely moose girl is in the house moosey oh yeah there you go that's right frumpy Moose, you just need to give them the old Moose Girl from Freaker's Ball, Moose Girl. That'll tell them. Yeah. You know, I used to I used to actually answer the door for, you know, like Jehovah Witnesses and that kind of stuff. But I got really tired of telling them I, it's, it wasn't my day to babysit Jesus. Y'all lost him. You go find him. You know, that kind of stuff. I mm, And the other ones, yeah, I got really tired of telling, like, the Cancer Society and the Heart Society and all those other ones, excuse me, but you guys ain't doing nothing to fight cancer because if you were, you would be dealing with nutrition. Because even back then, I knew that nutrition pay, played a role in it. But I don't even talk to any of them. Yes, Moosey, we are a very dysfunctional chat family, but ain't it great? Thank you for that bubbler. Oh, Rob works is off to play some bocce ball. Have fun. <laughs> bocce ball, bocce ball. Who's got a bocce ball? Hi, lovely Kate. How are you doing, lady? Down in the great state of Florida. I also see Asmo is here. Hey, Asmo. And the lovely Beth Z. Then there's Chalcedonian. Yeah, I got to say this. Rob works, you're overachieving with the double bubbler thing. Double bubble. Hey, that's kind of cool. Um, Where am I at? Chalcedony and Chloe is here. Free enslaved. Hi, Free. How you doing, hon? How's Fang? I know he's huge among us, but yeah. And big puppies are kind of, kind of, yeah. They're big puppies. I about got run over by mine today. Um... Let's see. Yeah, speaking of me, I'm me. There I am. I'm right there. I also see I.B. Doncy and I.B. Doncy Woik. He's an overachiever as well. Java Doctor 2 is in the house because he's, well, new and improved. As well as JJ's. I saw you over on Twitter, JJ's, giving all them puds a bunch of stuff and nonsense and things and stuff like that. Hi, Wana Taco. Did you ever get your refried beans? I saw in the chat. I don't remember which day because they all run together. Uh, did you get your beans? I haven't had any for a while, so I'm running low on rocket fuel. <laughs> and it's too hot to make chili. So, hi, Meister Brow. How are you doing, hon? I also see the lovely Rain is in the chat, as well as RLM Fluke, the Van White of the RLM channel. Rob Works is still here. He hasn't left to go play bocce ball yet. Um, let's see, what else? Trust no one who is keeping a close eye on the volcano. Good job, trusty feller. Yeah, those are awesome. I do like to watch that stuff. I'm kind of weird. Like, Of course, I'll stand outside and watch storms, too, because I'm retarded like that. <laughs> I'm from Kansas. What do you expect? I also see Woodman is here. Double dosing going on. And Colfax 101. As well as Dakota. 
and Dima. And then we have Echelon. I have not seen you chit chat yet, hon. Maybe that's just because I ain't paying Tation. I'm, I don't want to pay Tation. Because Tation doesn't necessarily sound fun. <clears throat> wow, that was fun. All of a sudden, my voice box said, fuck you. <laughs> F-bomb, by the way. Uh, hi, Ferris. How are you doing? Grimmy, quit! Grimmy, quit! We must just have Grimner 9. Grimner 9 from Outer Space. Um, Flash Nasty is still here. Flash Rooney, dude. And Frumpy. And Kozu. And Moy, 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 Moy. As well as, are you ready for all the pox? A pox be upon you, because we got a pox box and a poxified and a poxophone and a pox a home. We got lots of pox upon, a pox upon the government, wherever the government may roam. I have spoken. I also see pom 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 sauces in the house, as well as Skittle, Taste the Rainbow, and looky there, Phantom. <laughs> I can't do Phantom like, like Flash does. It's Phantom. I, I, I just can't do that dorky Jewy uh, voice. He's just, yeah. Okay, Sex, Death, Rebirth. Wow, that's, that's someone over on Mines. Whee, okay. Well, hey, climate legislation now, and most of the people that are pushing for that are not really good at using public transportation or recycling or using other eco-friendly behaviors. Yeah, imagine that. Of course, the ones that are, you know, I don't like the death penalty, but I also don't like abortion because I think abortion is giving someone the death penalty for not committing any crime other than showing up in the wrong womb. But have you ever noticed that a lot of the people that we say no to death penalty and, you know, they, they do all this outside prisons or whatever, and yet they're also the ones saying, we must have Planned Parenthood. You know how you plan your parenthood? Keep it in your britches. That's how you plan your parenthood. That's the only surefire way, unless aliens abduct you. That is a possibility. But I think I'm going to find some news now. Something that I found that maybe, you know, tripped my trigger or made me go, hmm, <coughs> excuse me. So, where am I at? Uh, do I want to go, let's see, things that sound and almost look the same, but they're actually completely different. This is from postis, postis or postis.com, however you wish to put that. So, you have your husky and your malamute, your turtle and your taurus. Well, a uh, husky is a faster native to Siberia, whereas a malamute is two to three times bigger and native to North America. Hmm, a turtle spends most of its time in the water, whereas a tortoise dwells on land. Now, I did know the turtle and tortoise, and the husky and malamute, you know, I honestly got to admit, I did not know that was the definite distinction between the two. I mean, I knew malamutes were bigger, but I didn't. Moving along, so, if you ever thought a tortoise and a turtle were the same thing, or a crocodile and an alligator, and I'm sure you have, but there's no shame to it. A lot of people, even native English speakers, tend to think that some things are the same, but to their surprise, they are completely different. You know, like government, when they do a law, and they say it's for one thing, and it does exactly the opposite. You know, you can make that correlation if you have a mind like mine. So, don't go there. It might hurt. Sometimes people tend to argue until they're blue in the face, telling others that these two things are exactly the same. So, you know what you should do in a situation like that, or basically any situation where you know you're right? You use your good friend Google. No, I will use DuckDuckGo, thank you very much, because they hold all the answers too, and they don't track me like Google does in googly eyes. So, apparently they've done the work for us on this one. The difference between alligators and crocodiles is an alligator has a U-shaped mouth, whereas a crocodile has a V-shaped snout. 
I personally don't plan on ever getting close enough to be able to see that subtle distinction, but that's just me. And we've already done the Husky and the Malamute. Now, Great Britain versus the United Kingdom. Great Britain includes England, Scotland, and Wales, whereas United Kingdom includes England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Ah, <coughs> what's wrong with the rest of Ireland? Did the rest of Ireland tell you to shove it up the old chocolate whiz way? Hmm? Poisonous versus venomous. Well, a poisonous thing would be organisms that deliver toxins when touched. Whereas venomous is organisms that inject their venom into organisms. Oh, the poisonous ones are when touched or eaten. Excuse me, I didn't scroll down far enough. Emoticon versus emoji. Ah, so an emoji are the real pictures whereas emoticons are a typographic display of a facial representation. Wow, that sounds so fancy schmancy when you put it like that. Llamas versus alpaca. Number one, they both spit. They do. I've been to petting zoos. They both spit. So, llamas have long curved ears and longer faces and are larger. Whereas alpacas have short spear-shaped ears, smooshed faces, and are smaller. Hmm, smooshed faces. So is that because the llama ran ahead of them and then really quick shut the door so that the alpaca went bam right into it? We always used to say that's what happened to little pug dogs. They was running too fast and someone slammed the door in their face and bam! <coughs> Excuse me. Rabbit versus hare. Apparently, rabbits give birth to their young in a burrow, where hares give birth above ground. And I'm sorry, but hares look like their faces are a lot thinner as well. I'm just going by the picture. Okay, we've already done the tortoise and the title. Hmm. Let me just let me just share this so you guys can follow along over here in the chat because some of these really are kind of cool. I did not know that that was um, high flow oxygen. Who's got high flow oxygen? I wish I did. Let me see. What you guys talking about here? Uh, Grimner 9 is now known as Grim. Oh, you're ice chatting? Sweet ice ice grimmer. Nobody who votes or pays taxes says no to any kind of government violence. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Hmm. Yes, alpacas and llamas are cool, but they do they do spit, Moosey. Okay. The difference between possums and opossums. Well, a possum lives in Australia, and they have bigger ears and eyes and furry tails. Whereas opossums live in North America, and they have smaller eyes and bald tails. It was a trade-off. You know, we have furry tails down here in Australia, but yeah, we can throw shrimp on the barbie. Whereas up here, mm, they have them beady little eyes and bald tails. That's just weird. <coughs> okay, a shrimp and a prawn. Oh, I did not know this. A shrimp, apparently, have claws on two of their five pairs of legs, whereas a prawn have claws on three of their five pairs of legs. So they have, ooh, it remind me not to mess with a prawn because they got extra pinchers. Concrete versus cement. Hmm. Now, cement is a binder that hardens into a, a solid compound, whereas concrete is made from crushed up stone, rock, and sand, and cement. Ah, ah, 
Okay, jam versus jelly. Did you know that jam, well, I knew this. Jam is made of the whole fruit, whereas jelly is made just from the juice. Those are cute little jars. Hmm, I wonder where they get those jars. A crow versus a raven. Oh, that's so cool. Okay, so a crow has a, thinner, uh, a thinner bill, shorter tail, and smaller in size. Whereas a raven has a thicker bill, longer tail, and bigger in size. Well, duh. Duh. And you know what? This weekend when I was out mowing, I was out on the ride mower, puttering along, doing my thing. And I, the birds always flock to wherever I have mowed. But there was a little patch, you know, because I was, I was kind of going around the edges and working my way towards the middle in the north lot. And um, there was a spot that I had mowed already, but I always had to come up by there because that's where my compost bins are so I can dump my clippings in. Well, there was a Mr. Crow and a Mrs. Crow, or at least they were going through the mating rituals because I interrupted them three times. And the last time, before he flew off, he turned around and gave me a look like, are you about done with this shit? But see, if they would stay over in the grass, where I'd cut, where they knew I wasn't going to go there anymore, I wouldn't be interrupting their dance. But I tell you what, it was cool to watch. It really was. They was just dancing all at well. She was kind of doing the whole squawky and walky thing and every once in a while raising her tail feathers, whereas he was getting all fancy schmancy and fluffing up his chest and doing the wings and then doing the fan dance with the tail and then jumping on her back and then, yeah, they were having fun. <laughs> right there in my yard. So, a pill versus a tablet. Hmm, a pill is round and, oh, um, it's a round and oval capsule. What? A pill? Oh, okay. And a tablet is powdered chemicals that are compressed. Ah, ah, I try not to take, okay, I take vitamins. Um, a seal versus a sea lion. Did you know that seals have ear holes with no flaps and long claws and are covered in fur, whereas a sea lion have ears with flaps, shorter claws, and are covered in sparser fur. They have the way cool whiskers thing going on. Hmm, I think they're both cute. Weather versus climate. Here you go. Weather is temporary condition of the atmosphere at a place. Whereas climate is the overall average weather at a place over a period of time. And climate changes, and so does weather. And yet, somebody wants to make a buck by charging all these people that don't have a freaking clue that that's the way nature works. How about lobster versus crayfish? I'm really enjoying this. I don't know about the rest of you. Oh, ooh. They're both ugly. Um, sorry, I just, yeah. Lobster comes from the sea, whereas crayfish comes from freshwater. Oh, hmm, okay. They're both still ugly. A sphinx, S-P-H-I-N-X versus a sphinx, S-P-H-Y-N-X. The first one is made of stone. It is a winged monster of Thebes, having a woman's head and a lion's body. I think that's because somebody buggered with the original artwork, but that's my opinion. Whereas the other one is a cat of a hairless breed, originally from North America. Really? Hairless cats came from here? It gets freaking cold here. The hell? Margarine versus butter. Butter, good. Margarine, evil. Butter is made of milk, whereas margarine is made of vegetable oil. Nasty. Nasty, nasty. Mushrooms versus toadstools. Ah, mushrooms are edible, whereas toadstools are poisonous. Ah, simple enough. Dolphin versus porpoise. 
cool. I like them too. Dolphins are larger and they have conical teeth and are very social, whereas a porpoise is smaller and they have flattened spade-shaped teeth and are very shy. Very shy. Champagne versus sparkling wine. I thought they were the same thing. I don't drink either one. Apparently, champagne is made in the Champagne region of France, whereas sparkling wine is not made in the Champagne region of France. Ah, Champagne. Labrador versus Golden Retriever. Okay, seriously, someone has a dif difficulty with that? Well, Labradors has a medium non-tapered muzzle and three solid coat colors. Really? Hmm. Whereas a Golden Retriever has a light brown or golden coat and a longer snout and longer hair, usually. Muffins versus cupcakes. Okay, this is another no-brainer. Cupcakes have icing. Muffins don't. Sad little muffin, but it, that muffin has... Mmm, looks like chocolate chips in it. Who needs icing when you have chocolate chips? How about this one? Nationality versus ethnicity. This is one I think a lot of people have trouble with. Ethnicity is people who have the same national, racial, or cultural origins, whereas nationality, um, the official right to belong to a particular country. Hmm, I identify more with the uh, cultural than the natural or national, whatever. A stalactite versus a stalagmite. Oh, that's an easy one, too, at least for me. Stalactites are the type of formation that hangs from the ceiling of caves, whereas a stalagmite is a type of formation that rises from the floor of the cave. And if you watched Lost in Space, the new one on Netflix, you would see that stalagmites are made by critters guano. But it's excellent fuel. <laughs> A butterfly or a moth. Hmm. Butterflies are um, do daytime flight, and wings. Oh, wings are held straight while resting, whereas moths are night flyers, and their wings are folded over and back while resting. Ah. Huh. How about oh, gorilla versus a gorilla. One is a large ape, and the other is a member of an unconventional military group. And you know there's an awful lot of people that would probably have, yeah. How about an armadillo versus a, a pangolin? Pangolin? They're, bo they're both like little critters with armor plating. But an armadillo has a ridgy, bony shell and a uh, number of bands on the back and flank, whereas a uh, pangolin, their body is covered with leaf-like sharp plates. Ooh, and I wonder if they were to flex those, if that would, that is their deterrent. Ah, how about a boat versus a ship? A boat is under 500 tons and operated in small or restricted waters, whereas a ship is above 500 tons and operated in oceanic areas or high seas, although some boats have been known to go on the high seas. How about a frog versus a toad? I have toads in my yard, and I wish my dogs would quit biting them because every time they do, they get all frothy-mouthed. In any case, a frog have long legs and smooth skins covered in mucus. Ew, boogers! Whereas toads have shorter legs and rougher, thicker skins. How about bees versus wasps? Bees are beneficial. Wasps are assholes with wings. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. But according to this, bees are pollinators, long and fat, non-aggressive, and live in wax hives. Also, Bees do not fly, they hoover, they hoover. And I'd read something about, because they are aerodynamically, they should not be able to fly. So I had read somewhere that they actually create a uh, anti-gravity field or a, some kind of magnetic field to where they can use the magnetics of the planet. And the wings are just for steering. 
I don't know, but it's pretty freaking cool. Because, yeah. <clears throat> Whereas, back to this, wasps are predators, long and thin, nearly all prey on insects, and live in papery nests. And they are assholes with wings, basically. Wow, another page. Holy smokes. How about tofu and paneer? Ooh, they both... Tofu is made of soy, whereas paneer is made of milk. Okay, I will do the paneer then. I don't want that soy shit. How about a banana versus a plantain? Hmm. Banana is a sweet yellow when ripe and used used as a fruit. Used as a fruit. Okay. Whereas a uh, plantain, is that? Yeah. Is starchy green when ripe and used as a vegetable. Oh, huh, hmm, oranges and tangerines, well, tangerines are smaller, duh, and they do have a different flavor to them. Now, oranges are spherical, whereas tangerines are a little skewed at both ends. In other words, the earth, according to, uh, well, not necessarily according to Neil deGrasse Titan, because he can't make up his mind what the earth is actually shaped like. But however he explains how the earth is shaped, it doesn't look anything like all those pictures that NASA gives us. Just saying. In any case, yeah, I would imagine if it really was the way Neil deGrasse says it is, then it would be shaped like a tangerine because with the, the rotation going on, it would get squattier and bigger in the middle. But what do I know? I, I'm not Bill Nye the science guy. And he's not a science guy either. He's an actor, for those of you that really believe that he knows his shit. He's, okay, some of it is probably sunk in, you know, because he's read this crap forever and ever and ever. But he started out as an engineer working for Boeing in Seattle. And he was trying to be a stand-up comedian. And he got hired for the Bill Nye the Science Guy gig. He really doesn't have any scientific training. So, you know. Anytime you use Bill Nye the Science Guy as your, um, this is the basis of fact, then I'm going to look at you and say, I'll bet you trust Snopes too, don't you? I'm happy for you. I'll just move along, okay? Okay, the difference between a kangaroo and a wallaby. I want to know this because I did not know. So, a kangaroo is large with long legs and a dull coat, whereas a wallaby is short with short legs and bright streaks. It is very pretty colors. How about a mouse and a rat? Well, a rat's bigger, number one. But a mouse is about the size of a sparrow, whereas a rat is larger, ranging from 18 um, to 25 cm. Hmm. How about a mug versus a cup? Yeah. I don't use coffee cups. I use mugs. So, a mug is used for coffee or chocolate and is thicker, whereas a cup is used for tea and is smaller for those of the daintier inclined. I, okay. Mm, How about a biscuit versus a cookie? It depends on where you're from. Because according to this, biscuits are crunchy, whereas cookies are a variety of biscuit um, are a variety of biscuits which are soft. And uh, over in the UK, they called cookies biscuits. Because the kids were saying, "Grammy, you want some biscuits?" And I thought, "Oh, cool biscuits! All right." And they brought me a cookie, and it's like, "No, this is a cookie." No, Grammy, they call them biscuits here. Weird. Weird. Okay. That's the extent of that, because I clicked the next page and it went to some woman being stalkered. So, hmm, the very fascinating. I'm going to go put this over on the effing site as well. I didn't know some of those. I like learning things and, and making you listen. <laughs> oh, I can really make you listen, too. I have so much control over your fingers when they reach for the knob to turn it off. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Let me get this shared real quick. Wow. Fascinating. Fascinating. Okay.
where do I want to go now? Because that was fun. So, here we go. Let's go to this one. This one is from Steemit.com. I happen to see it over on uh, Twitter. Antimedia is uh, one of them that posted it. So, uh, how to see the apps tracking you on Facebook and block them. Hmm. So following a lengthy silence in the wake of the Cambridge Analytica scandal where it was revealed that a data firm was able to obtain personal information from over 50 million Facebook accounts, company CEO Mark Zuckerberg finally spoke out on Wednesday. Did he now? Was that this Wednesday? No, it must have been last month. Okay. In any case, we have a responsibility to protect your data, and if we can't, then we don't deserve to serve you. Is this How to Serve Man, that cookbook we're talking about here? Stir-fried, you guys like stirring us up. Okay, mm apparently Zuckerberg went on to say, I've been working to understand exactly what happened and how to make sure this doesn't happen again. Well, Facebook's top dog then embarked on a small media tour, addressing several of the major concerns highlighted by the unsavory affair. So, while speaking with the Wall Street Journal, for instance, Sucky Berg said his company has launched an investigation into third-party developers who are doing bad things with users' personal data on the Facebook platform. Now, when I see some excuse me, someone say that they are launching an investigation. To me, that means we're going to form a committee. <laughs> and I think y'all know how this whole committee shit works. You know, it takes them about 15 months just to get all of the people in place on the committee because some of them, they find out what's actually going on because the name never means exactly what they're going to do. And so some of them that are on that committee that think, oh, we're going to do what this name says. And then they find out it doesn't. It's like, fuck that shit. I ain't going to be part of this stuff. So they leave. And so they have to replace him with another mindless dolt. But apparently there are people doing bad things with users' personal data on fakey book. No. I'd have never guessed. Apparently, he also admitted that, like any security precaution, it's not that this is a bulletproof solve, and that no mechanism by itself is ever going to find every single thing. True. In other words, if you do not want that information getting in hands of someone that may use it against you, or may have nefarious purposes, don't put it on the internet. Period. It really is that simple. Now, you know, I'm sure crooks and, and bad guys would all just absolutely love to see your dining trail of, well, I went here tonight and this is what I had. And I went here tonight and this is what I had. And I went here tonight and I had this drink. And I went, you know, make them crazy. That could be fun. I know I see those things and I just keep scrolling. Keep on scrolling. <laughs> In any case, so, while it's great that the company is taking a proactive step, the effort is not likely to comfort those users who feel their privacy has already been violated. I feel so violated. <laughs> then quit. What's more, Suckyberg conceded in an interview that the investigation may take months or more to complete. But wait, there's more. You know, it's just like those diet commercials. If you try this product, you could lose up to 10 pounds in a week. You could. It ain't likely, but you could. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. It could take months or more. What did I say about 15 months just to get the committee started? Yeah. <laughs> In the meantime, there are options available to those who refuse to simply wait around while Fakey Book gets its collective act together. I would have said another three-letter word that starts with A, but they used act. 
For starters, stop using the Login with Facebook option after downloading an app. I don't ever use that. Ever. <clears throat> and uh, it may take a bit longer to create a new account, but the app won't be getting access to your private information from Fakey Book. Yeah, and the company itself admits that is what happens. Now, for the apps that you're already using, there's a fairly simple process for managing the types of data that they can access. So, um, or if you prefer, the same process allows you to delete the entire the app entirely. So, and it has a little step-by-step -step process of how to go through tending to all of this stuff. And uh, thank you, Antimedia, for this. I will let you check out the step-by-step -step process because it really is very informative and I am going to share this over on Fakey Book later because I have some family members. You know what? I hit that stupid and then I forgot to click it as in yeah here you go. Vinny! Are you Putin over here Vin? Damn it dude! Do that outside! Criminy Christmas! That's just disgusting! Okay, Grimmy's using Ice Chat. I may have to check out Ice Chat. Hmm, okay. You have a few. N oh, hmm. <laughs> Frumpy, you're pervy little bugger, ain't you? And no, you don't always need icing. I don't like icing myself. But. I will sprinkle powdered sugar on top of a cake, but I would much rather have like fruit that um, I've cooked up and made into made a syrup. <coughs> excuse me, a syrup out of it than uh, icing. I'm just not that crazy about icing. And you see them cakes with the frickin' inch thick icing? Nah. You give me a piece of cake like that, and first thing I do is scrape that shit off. I don't need that crap. That's just nasty. Okay. Let me put this over here on the Evan side. I keep looking up at all my tabs and I have Eustace up there. I haven't finished listening to Eustace. But I don't want to click on it. Because then Eustace will start. And I'm not ready to finish listening to it yet. Okay. There we go. And that one is a good news. So, now, can I, can I get it? Amen. Okay, this is another one that was over here um, in the RLM chat. Y'all are just so dang awesome. I actually got a couple of them from over here in the RLM chat. But this one is from investmentwatchblog.com. Do you know that sitting down too much can make you stupid? Stupid? New research says a sedentary lifestyle alters areas of the brain linked to memory. Yeah. <laughs> it's because it starves oxygen, or it starves the brain of oxygen. If you're sitting on your ass, ain't no air go up through the... <laughs> okay. Apparently, it's from originally, <laughs> excuse me, from Natural News. So, you watch what you eat and make sure that you get a good night's sleep. You regularly step outdoors to get your daily dose of natural vitamin D from the sun, which I got some of that this weekend, and my shoulders are just as ghost tender. In any case, but on weekdays, you work an eight-hour job that requires you to stay tied to your desk practically the whole time. Wow. The difference between that and prison is prison, you get a free lunch. <laughs> it may not be that tasty, but eh. So, according to a new study, this unhealthy lifestyle could offset most everything you've done to stay healthy. Researchers from the University of California, Los Angeles, or UCLA, found that sitting too long, like smoking, carries the same risks. 
These include heart disease, diabetes, and even premature death. How do they know what premature death is? How does anybody know what premature death is? I mean, seriously, you know, do, do you get a little time card that, you know, you start hearing the tick, 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 when it starts getting closer to the end of your time? What is a premature death? You know, it's kind of like earning a living. What the hell? You're already living. Why do you have to earn it? What the hell? In any case, back to this. So, in their quest to see if the sedentary lifestyle affects brain health, researchers gathered 35 people ages between 45 and 75. The research team asked them about their physical activities and the usual number of hours they spent sitting during the previous week. Each of the participants underwent a high-resolution MRI scan, which gave a detailed view of the me medial temporal lobe, or MTL, which is a part of the brain responsible for creating new memories. Oh, so it's on your backside. Okay. <laughs> The researchers discovered that sedentary behavior can significantly predict thinning of the MTL. They also found that the harmful effects of sitting to brain health are irreversible. No, they're not. Don't give me this, it's irreversible bullshit. Not even high levels of physical activity can compensate for the damage that has been done. I call bullshit. But I don't have MD behind my name. I'm just crazy. So I have RC for rocket chair. <laughs> Apparently, the researchers discovered that sedentary behavior can significant. Okay, I already read that. See, I'm sitting. That's what's wrong. That's why I'm like I am. <laughs> Our present-day lifestyle, characterized by the prevalence of gadgets that make us sit down for longer periods of time, makes sedentary behavior, excuse me, rascal, uh, part of our daily routine. Oh, hi, dudes. And if you can't change this kind of lifestyle, what can you do to reduce its effect? Well, if you can do something to reduce its effects, then it is irreversible. Duh. Okay, so get clean food and help support our mission to keep you informed. Uh, blah, 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 blah. So, um, get up during commercial breaks, stand up, fold clothes, do a few push ups or sit ups, wash the dishes, stretch, take out the garbage, etc. Break up that sedentary time that comes from screen based activities. What if you don't have commercial TV? I guess I get up in between movies. <laughs> oh, I can't even just sit and watch one. I have to get up and because I'll hear the buzzer on the dryer or I'll think of something or I'll have to go to the bathroom or whatever, whatever. I don't ever sit that long. And if I do, it's probably because I got a grandkid on my lap. So there you go. Or a cat. Okay. Uh, putter around the garden. The American Heart Association classifies gardening as moderate exercise. You haven't done my kind of gardening. Many people with green thumbs will tell you gardening is not only mentally and spiritually uplifting, but it's also good exercise which prevents obesity. Yes, I agree with all of that. Or you could run. Apparently a recent study showed that even 5 to a 10 minute run a day at slow speeds, less than 6 miles per hour, can reduce the risk of death from all causes, except for getting hit when you aren't watching when you run through an intersection. It also reduces the risk of developing heart disease. I don't run. I will walk fast. I do not run. You stand up. Apparently, it pays to stand up every 20 minutes or get away momentarily from your desk. I used to do that all the time when I st still had the 9 to 5 -er thing going on. So, uh, you can also work on a standing desk or take calls standing up. 
Stand up, fill your water jug to the brim at the water station to prolong the time you're standing up, and instead of chatting online, walk over to a colleague's cubicle and talk about work. No. The face-to-face -face communication will also allow you to exchange more ideas and observe each other's reactions. That's part of communication. That's why there are so many missed signals out there because you cannot put nuances into a text. You just plan. I try. I try with my capitalization and italicizing and punctuation and whatever, but it just don't work like a face-to-face -face communication where you can see the body language or even just a verbal discussion where you can hear the difference in the inflection or tone of the voice. Oh well, take the stairs. Climbing the stairs expends eight to nine times more energy than sitting down. No. And around seven times more energy than taking the elevator. No. Really? Dear. Hey, you could also walk. A nurse's health study found that people who walked briskly or had moderate exercise for at least 30 minutes a day had a low risk of sudden cardiac death during 26 years of follow-up. Another study revealed that walking can prevent dementia more than any number of crossword puzzles. Still another study reveals that three five-minute walks throughout the workday can offset the harm in peripheral leg arteries brought about by too much sitting. So, get up. Leave that computer chair for a while and get going. Your body and your mind will thank you for it. So, I think that was Rob Works that put that in the chat. Thank you, Rob. Vinny, are you being uptight? I see uptight in the chat. Uptight. You know, do you hear about the guy that found the the bottle um on the beach? You know, it's was, it was pretty sand encrusted and pretty nasty looking. But it, it was a unusual shape, so he picked it up and he kind of knocked off some of the sand and rubbed some shit off of it and the next thing you know, here comes this genie out of the bottle and it says I will grant you three wishes O master for releasing me from the bottle and the and the guy is thinking and thinking and the genie says be careful what you wish for and the guy says I know exactly what I want I want to be uptight out of sight and all squeezed in and bada bing bada boom the genie turned him into a tampon <laughs> I know it's stupid, but I liked it. <laughs> oh well. Let's see. Yeah, I think I'll do the zombie one for that one. Okay, what else is going? Actually, Grim, you can walk sitting down if you put a chair by your treadmill. <laughs> Or they have those little pedal things that while you're at your computer desk, you can just be pedaling away. Or they have that way cool bicycle that uh, hooks up to like a battery pack or whatever. And so you can power your computer while you're sitting at the computer. So you're getting a workout while you're sitting at the computer. I may actually have to get one of those. I've seen those. They're probably expensive as all get out. But they do look rather cool. You know. Okay. Uh, done that one, done that one, done that one. I think I'm going to go to my pocket. I think, I think, I think, I think. I'm just going to go ahead and share this one um, real quick. It's, you know, seeing as how I was talking about people being sedentary and all that fun stuff, it's from the health expert. And um, yourhealthexperts.com. It's nine easy stretches to release lower back and hip pain. And um, basically it just walks you through all of these different exercises that you can do, which I don't do them all throughout the day, but, you know, I'd say I probably do at least half of them 
intermittently throughout the day. So, yeah, they're kind of cool. Although when I shared it on Fakey Book last week, I had one person tell me, no, I would break myself. <laughs> Vinny <laughs> in 3D. Holy smokes, Vinny. Is that kind of a reach out and touch someone kind of thing? I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Okay. I saw this over on Minds. Um, and I thought, oh, that looks rather interesting. So, it's from Arthur O'Keefe, Weebly.com. And um, it's from his article, Essays, Articles, and Fiction. The Morally Imperative Lie in Twain's Kentucky Yankee. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Why, thank you, Java. Okay, so. This was apparently originally published in the Midwest Quarterly, Autumn of 2012. But here we go. Mark Twain was a liar, at least according to Twain. Dishonesty was a trait he cheerfully claimed to share with the rest of humanity. Huckleberry Finn begins with Huck informing the reader that Twain told the truth, mainly in penning Tom Sawyer, but that I never seen anybody but lied one time or another. Now, in a 1905 letter to his old friend Joseph Twitchell, Twain wrote that even I am dishonest, not in many ways, but in some. 41, I think it is. 41 ways. So, lying is a recurring point in Twain's fiction and nonfiction, and it's no great wonder then that the lie features as a major motif in Twain's 1889 novel, The Kentucky Yankee in King Arthur's Court. Historically, authority, whether secular or ecclesiastical or some amalgamation of the two, has admonished the individual to eschew mendency and embrace honesty and to ostensibly or the ostensible underpinning of civilized behavior. Twain turns this entire assumption on its head by giving us a hero who repeatedly lies lies to, deceives, and withholds information from nearly everyone he meets. Through Con uh, Connecticut Yankee, protagonist Hank Morgan, did I say Kentucky before Connecticut? The, uh, Hank Morgan, or through his protagonist Hank Morgan, Twain compels the thoughtful reader to reconsider what we always thought we knew about ourselves. Hank Morgan is, like Twain, a liar. By dint of shamelessly masking technological prowess as magic, he becomes the most powerful man in Arthur Arthurian Britain, fundamentally altering its society. So, while a number of writers have postulated that this is one of several um, malign aspects of Hank's behavior, in keeping with the view, for example, that the Connecticut Yankee as a dystopian warning against totalitarianism, the assertion here is that the lies and deceptions he deploys are not necessary, or not only necessary, but are rooted in moral clarity. Hmm. Twain's antipathy towards what he perceived as malignant forms of authority a.k.a. monarchy, aristocracy, slave system, organized religion, is highlighted in the motif of the morally imperative lie. This is moreover evinced by Twain's stated views on the lie as an integral aspect of the human condition. And in the case of Connecticut Yankee, by evidence that Twain sympathizes with his protagonist. In his 1899 essay, my first lie and how I got out of it, Twain
Twain recounts catching a friend in a minor lie, that of returning the greeting of a stranger in pretended recognition, and then reassured him, Don't be troubled, we all do it. Well, Twain takes the dishonesty inherent in general human intercourse for granted, as something wired into us. In contrast, he asserts that the silent, colossal national lie that is the support and confederate of all the tyrannies and shams and inequalities and unfairnesses that afflict the peoples, that is the one to throw bricks and sermons at. Twain here highlights a form of willful self-deception, the silent assertion that as long as we refuse to mention an injustice, we can pretend it doesn't exist. As examples, he cites the lack of widespread acknowledgement of the early abolitionist movements in the United States, French silence at the injustice of the Dreyfus Affair, and the British public's refusal to recognize Joseph Chamberlain's manufacture of the Second Boer War. Another attack by Twain on the deceptions of malignant authority can be found in To the Person Sitting in Darkness, published in the North American Review in 1901. In, at in attacking the imperialism of his time and its rationales, he quotes the hypothetical proponent of America's war in the Philippines. There have been lies, yes but they were told in a good cause. We have been treacherous, but that was only in order that real good might come out of apparent evil. True, we have crushed and deceived and confining people. We have turned the weak and the friendless who trusted us. We have stabbed an ally in the back and slap the face of a guest, but each detail was for the best. Through Twain, or though Twain presents this rationale in the spirit of caustic sarcasm against malignant lies, i.e. the hypocrisies of imperialism, he elsewhere expresses the view that deception is at times not only harmless, as in my first lie, but even desirable. In his 1882 essay, On the Decay of the Art of Lying, Twain asserts that lying is universal. We all do it. We all must do it. Therefore, the wise thing is for us diligently to train ourselves to lie thoughtfully, judiciously, to lie with good object and not an evil one. Hmm. Twain postulates that the lie is a natural underpinning of civilization that spans all levels of human interaction, and by implication, all of human history, which falls under the, it's his story, and they just dropped an S, and now it's history. Garden variety lies are nothing to fret over. We can't avoid them in any case, but if lies per se are unavoidable, the big lies that aid the machinations and malignant authority are what one should condemn. Lies in and of themselves are not evil. The moral quality of a lie is defined by its objective. Twain's Connecticut Yankee serves as a fictive framework for these same assertions. In examining this aspect of the novel, it's necessary to address the frequently debated issue of whether protagonist Hank Morgan is a malignant, if not totalitarian, authority figure, and the frequent assertion that Connecticut Yankee is a dystopian commentary on technology-based political power in turn necessitates the view of Hank Morgan as the, at best, a well-meaning fool at worst, an evil dictator. The argument herein, however, is that the ubiqui ubiquitous, let's say that again, ubiquitous 
motif of the morally imperative lie in Connecticut Yankee evinces the status of Hank Morgan as an essentially benign character with whom Twain sympathizes. This in turn evinces the evinces, evinces that the novel, in terms of authorial inter or intention, serves as a fictive expression of Mark Twain's oft-stated antipathy towards monarchy, slavery, and organized religion. Twain presents the reader with a dystopia, but with a thwarted utopia, in which deception is vital, and thus morally justified both for survival and for the protagonist's utopian attempts to socially reform. Now, the view of Connecticut Yankee as depicting the thwarted utopia is supported by Twain himself. Everett Carter cites in 1888 notebook entry in which Twain, identifying himself with the protagonist, writes, I make a peaceful revolution and introduce in advanced civilization. The church overthrows it with a six-year in interdict, or interdict, whatever, church. <laughs> this indicates that Twain envisioned in Hank Morgan's reform not a false utopian or dystopian scheme, but an inherently beneficent attempt that was deliberately destroyed. Now, parallels between Twain's nonfiction statements on the subject of monarchy and those of Hank Morgan in Connecticut Yankee also strongly indicate that Hank served not as a cautionary example of the deranged dictator, but as the vehicle for Twain's personal views. In another 1888 notebook entry, Twain states that the institution of royalty in any form is an insult to the human race, which I happen to agree with. Hank Morgan virtually mirrors this when he says, any kind of royalty, howsoever modified, is rightly an insult. Now, a notebook entry from the same year insists that if all the male monarchs on the earth were stripped naked and made to march around a circus ring with 500 naked mechanics, the crowd would be unable to pick out the sovereigns. You can't tell a king from a copper except you differentiate their exteriority. This is essentially identical to Hank Morgan's statement regarding a prisoner he was has released from Morgan Le Fay's dungeons whose crime had been to say that if you were to strip the nation naked and send a stranger through the crowd, he couldn't tell the king from a quack doctor, nor a duke from a hotel clerk. Now, Hank Morgan is under imminent pressure from the type of authority that he and Twain despise the most. Virtually all the deceptions Hank employs are absolutely necessary, first and foremost for self-preservation. Illustrating his contempt for the lies and deceptions of tyranny, Twain parabolically fights fire with fire by way of a protagonist who resorts to deception in the face of a hostile and destructive power. If lies are for Hank Morgan morally imperative, for the knights and church they furnish rationales for oppression. For the masses of Arthurian Britain, fear stimulates the lies of omission that keep them from openly questioning authority. The motif of the lie not only recurs repeatedly, but is integral to establishing from the story's beginning the relationship between Hank and traditional figure authority figures. Oh, my doggie seems to think she wants in. So, Hank's initial situation is characterized by extreme danger and helplessness. Soon after his inexplicable, tr or yeah, his inexplicable transport from the 19th century Connecticut to 6th century England, he's captured by the knight Sir Kay um, and brought before King Arthur's court in Camelot. 
Hank soon learns that he has been abducted purely for the purpose of increasing Sir Kay's bragging rights. After relating to the king and court a false tale of having captured Hank, the man-devouring ogre, in a far land of barbarians, Sir Kay condemns Hank to burn at the stake. Hank only saves himself by using a fortuitous solar eclipse to claim to be a wizard with the power to destroy the sun. This event, occurring almost at the very beginning of the novel, is pivotal in establishing the vital role of deception in Hank's relationship to the nobility and church. That is, his relationship to the traditional established authorities of the world he has unwillingly been cast into. Sir Kay has the legal right to capture and order the execution of anyone he wants, at least of the lower classes, including Hank. The rationale for this is not only that Hank, as a commoner, is seen as possessing a life of negligible value, it's also because Hank, according to Sir Kay, is a man-devouring ogre who surrendered only after a three-hour battle in which Hank attempted to escape by jumping 200 cubits to the top of a tree. Sir Kay attempts to justify what amounts to the kidnapping and attempted murder of an innocent person by lying. Having no alternative but being burned to death, Hank lies also. And when the eclipse begins, just as the torch is about to be applied, he claims to be magically causing the sun to disappear and warns that unless he is released, he will blot it out forever and thereby destroy the world. <laughs> now, this episode is consistently ignored in those analyses that attempt to place Hank Morgan on the morally equal footing of his antagonists. However, it is a crucial element in understanding the nature of the relationship between Hank and the ruling classes of Camelot, especially as it correlates precisely with Twain's repeatedly stated views of religiously rationalized monarchical systems. It is perhaps Twain's starkest example of a morally imperative lie in the face of oppressive authority, prompting and necessitating Hank's other actions, compelling an agreement whereby he becomes Arthur's first minister, and embarking upon a program of technological innovation and social engineering, with no less a goal than modernizing a feudal society. So, there's a long-standing assertion among some writers that Hank Morgan is something of a sinister figure, a man who is no less malignant than the authority he attempts to displace. Specific deset or descriptions include Derek Parker Royal's assessment of Hank as possessing an ambition that refuses to be contained. Well, I know a lot of people like that. Or how about... Gerald Allen's assertion that he acts with cruelty and inhumanity? Or how about Alan Gutman's view of Hank as one whose wake is strewn with terror and corpses? Or Chadwick Hansen's argument that Hank's career and personality prefigure those of 20th century dictators? Then there's Quentin Young's, Youngberg's argument that he serves as the fiction or fictive function of the ideology of manifest destiny and the war on terrorism of George W. Bush. While not truly synoptic, the common element of all of these views can be summarized thus. Hank Morgan's overriding goal is power, whether for its own sake or for some quixotically grotesque dystopian scheme, which he pursues ruthlessly. Such opinions are important to consider in seeking to understand the Connecticut Yankee, in terms of the authorial intention and the motif of the lie. 
the megalomaniacal Hank Morgan, would be a protagonist the author did not sympathize with, a man seeking to replace one malignant system with another. Twain's description of Hank as a ignoramus to Connecticut Yankee illustrator Dan Beard has often been cited as evidence that Twain saw, Twain saw Hank as evil. However, Everett Carter has noted that this comment was made in the context of a highly favorable description of Hank. Deborah Baker Wyrick asserts that Twain's use of the term ironic and in reference to the refinements and weaknesses of a college education. <laughs> that would most definitely be an educated idiot or an ignoramus in my books. Oh, I got thunder boomers going on. Um, asserting that the external evidence seems weighted in Hank's favor, Carter cites a letter from Twain to his wife featured on page okay, of Dixon Wechter's Love Letters of Mark Twain, and Twain expressed his disappointment that playwright Howard Taylor's stage production of Connecticut Wank uh, Yankee Wanky <laughs> omitted the good heart and high intent of Hank Morgan and degraded a natural gentleman to a low-down blackguard. So, with nothing external but the out-of-context ignoramus quote, to go by, the only way one can argue that Hank is a mal malign despot is to ignore authorial intention altogether. Holy smokes! It's getting rather windy out here. So, um, a more detailed analysis of Hank as a tyrant assertions would merit its own paper, but on the point of the argument will uh, be largely confined to addressing two fundamental questions. Who in 6th century England is unhappy with Hank's actions? And is this because these actions are in intent or effect comparable to malignant authoritarians such as Hitler? The answer to the first question is readily apparent. The church is highly discontented with the changes Hank brings to England, as are ultimately the knights whom the church incites into counter-revolution, and it's the church that proclaims the interdict and the knights that launch an attack against Hank, Clarence, and their comrades. The answer to the second question is no. Um, evidenced in part by the answer to the first. The Hitler analogy offered by Hansen, for example, is of an authority structure that targeted masses of people in arbitrary and oppressive ways. Horror at Hitler's actions was ultimately ubiquitous. His victims were people whose only offense was the fact of their existence. Unhappiness with Hank Morgan's actions is essentially confined to the ruling classes because Hank is preventing them from maintaining traditions of feudalism, slavery, and class distinctions. Hitler's populist, popularist, or populist rhetoric was a sham because for him the Volk meant the racial elite. He targeted peoples in mass. Hank not only confines his antagonism to the traditional ruling elites, but issues violence unless he is under imminent physical attack, such as when he blows up two attacking knights with a dynamite bomb. The only true incidents of arbitrary violence that he commits are having the humorist Sir Denandon executed for publishing a terrible joke book and allowing Morgan Le Fay to hang her band of playing off key. Okay, I gotta stop here for just a sec because I gotta let my dogs in because we got a thunderstorm moving in. So just a sec. Okay, 
I'm back. That didn't take long. I don't have a long enough leash on this headset to be able to do that while I'm still leashed and talking. So, let me see how much longer this goes on, because, wow, it looks like he's really... Uh, here's just a quick little... Uh, maybe... Okay. Let's try this one. Just, I'm going to do a couple of quick little excerpts from this, and then I'm going to share it with you. Because I, th I think it's fascinating. I think he uses entirely too many really big words, you know, where smaller ones would suffice. Um, ones that most people would understand would suffice. You know, it's kind of like he's writing a piece of legislation with some of... But I do like it. I'm enjoying this. I'm going to have to finish reading it later, you know, if I don't lose power. In any case... Here's a little excerpt here. Uh, the kind of leaders Hank claims to despise most are those who exist in aristocratic, monarchical sy uh, systems. And Hank expresses this view by explaining the conclusions he's come to regarding his new society. The most of King Arthur's nation were slaves, pure and simple, and bore that name. And the rest were slaves, in fact, but without the name. The truth was, the nation as a body was in the world for one object and one only, to grovel before king and church and noble, to slave for them, sweat blood for them, starve that they might be fed, work that they might play, drink misery to the dregs that they may be happy. And for all this, the thanks they got were cuffs and contempt. So, this does go on for, oh, I guess maybe not too much longer. He's got an awful lot of um, references at the bottom of this. Uh, another one, another point that he brings up here. Um, the oppressive condition Hank refers to are illustrated specifically during his incognito journey with the king, such as when a woman is hanged for stealing in order to feed her child. There's nothing in the text of Connecticut Yankee to indicate that Hank's position of power has resulted in anything remotely like the situation he describes above. If one points to the fact of deception per se to assert that Hank has become the type of leader he claims to despise most, one runs the risk of ignoring the concept, context of such deception. So why does Hank deceive? What alternatives, if any, are open to him? Are his deceptions in intent and effect <clears throat> similar to those of his antagonists? The morally imperative nature of all of Hank's deceptions subsequent to the eclipse is evinced by the grudging, conditional acceptance given him by the nobility. I was admired, also feared, but it was as an animal is admired and feared. The animal is not reverenced, neither was I. I was not even respected. I had no pedigree, no inherited title, so in the king's and noble's eyes, I was mere dirt. Now, is any of this, you know, kind of clicking with what's going on right now for any of y'all? Holy shit. It's Hank's out alleged magical powers that elicit this attitude, and he achieves a false relationship of power in using the e eclipse to convince everyone that he is a powerful wizard. And this gradually changes into the actual balance of power as he develops and controls a modern infrastructure. He has little other choice because he is an alien in this world and cannot strike out for the territory like Huck Finn. He has no reason to believe that any place he might go would be any safer than the region around Camelot. So, it really does sound like he did tell a few moral imper morally imperative lies. So, as a protagonist who must continually apply deception to save his own life, 
Hank Morgan functions as a vehicle to convey Mark Twain's antipathy towards monarchy, slavery, class systems, and their religious rationales. The motif of the morally imperative lie supports a fictive parallel to Twain's caustic attacks on the tyrannies and shams and inequalities of malignant authority and his insistence that since as a species we employ deception in any case, our lies should be, like Hank Morgan's, for a morally clear objective. Through Hank, Twain, Twain drives home the view that dishonesty and immorality are not mutually inclusive, and in so doing, he simultaneously rebukes those situations or institutions that he sees as malign and compels us to reassess the role of honesty and, converse, and conversely dishonesty in human society. So thank you ever so much. I did kind of sort of jump around quite a bit here. Um, thank you Arthur O'Keefe for this. I will finish reading it later. Um, go ahead and share this. Reaching around a camel? No, Vinny, I'm not reaching around a camel, hon. And no running in hallways. That's right. Don't run in the hallways. Okay, I saw that poxified. Is that poxified or pox? Yeah, it was poxified. Okay, I'm going to put this on the effing site as well. And then I'm going to go to the pig, and I may because it's really whipping up out there. I may cut out of here a little bit early just to, uh, what the hell? It's telling me internal server error, but that ain't right. That's posting the link, no big deal. So, let me go check out the pig real quick. I know, I know. Rumble, rumble, rumble outside. I'm assuming you guys can hear that, because if I can hear it through my headphones, I'm assuming you guys can hear it as well. Okay, over here on PIGazette.com, the home of Hambo and Porcus, the word of the day is shock therapy. It's the best way to make John Kerry understand you're not Secretary of State anymore, numb nuts. Oh, no, no. He, he looks like the the backside of a southbound yeah whatever in the quotable quotes section no one with a day's experience in government fails to realize that in all bureaucracies there are three implacable spirits self-perpetuation expansion and incessant demand for more power Herbert Hoover that's pretty true. Yeah, yeah, old Herbie. You, you nailed it with that one. Okay. Um, what's this? Okay. These are funny because they're true. I didn't believe these laws at first, but have found them to be true from actual experience. Forget Newton and Galileo, here are the real laws of nature. How about the law of mechanical repair? After your hands become coated with grease, your nose will begin to itch and you'll have to pee. <laughs> yes, the law of gravity. Any tool, nut, bolt, screw will, or when dropped, will roll to the least accessible corner and any slice of bread that has had peanut butter or butter or whatever something spread upon it is going to fall gunky side down that's a fact the law of probability the probability of being watched is directly proportional to the stupidity of your act i'm so glad i live out here in the boonies the law of random numbers 
If you dial a wrong number, you never get a busy signal, and someone always answers. Now, that's got to be an oldie because, yeah, <clears throat> most people, if they don't recognize a number, they don't answer the phone. Supermarket law. As soon as you get in the smallest line, the cashier will have to call for help. Yes. Yes. The variation law. If you change lines or traffic lanes, the one you were in always moves faster than the one you're in now. Mm-hmm. The law of the bath. When the body is fully immersed in water, the telephone rings. And I just let it ring. The law of close encounters. It's the probability of meeting someone you know increases dramatically when you are with someone you don't want to be seen with. <laughs> Imagine that. The law of result. When you try to prove to someone that a machine won't work, it will. That happened this freaking weekend. I could not get my damn riding mower to start, and it's like, God dang it. And my farmer came home, and I told him about it, and he said, well, let me go out and check it. Some bitch. Damn thing started right up for him. It's like, okay, I see how you are. Obviously, I didn't have my eyes crossed. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Okay. The law of biomechanics. The severity of the itch is inversely proportional, proportional to the reach. You know, like you have an itchy ass when you've got really, really tight pants on and you just plain cannot get it. Mm. The coffee law. As soon as you sit down to a cup of hot coffee, your boss will ask you to do something which will last until the coffee is cold. Yes. Murphy's Law of Lockers. If there are only two people in a locker room, they will have adjacent lockers. You know, that also tends to be, yeah. The Law of Physical Surfaces. The chances of an open-faced jam sandwich landing face down on the floor are directly correlated to the newness of the cost of the carpet or rug. Yeah. The Law of Logical Argument. Anything is possible if you don't know what you're talking about. That is true. That is true. So if you're not an edumacated idiot, you can pr you can claim whatever you damn well please. Holy shit. Okay, sorry. I keep looking out the windows and going, damn. Um, Brown's Law of Physical Appearance. If the clothes fit, they're ugly. Or comfy. Uh, Oliver's Law of Public Speaking. A closed mouth gathers no feet. Oh, see, that's why I, I, I... Moving along. Wilson's Law of Commercial Marketing. Or Commercial Marketing Strategy. As soon as you find a product that you really, really like, they will stop making it. Oh my God, that's why I always buy at least two or three. And the doctor's law. If you don't feel well, make an appointment to go to the doctor. By the time you get there, you'll feel better. But don't make an appointment and you'll stay sick. This has been proven over and over by taking children to the pediatrician. Yes, and you'll feel even worse once you leave because number one, you'll get the bill, and number two, your kids will more than likely get an inoculation. Stay away from those nasty things. Okay, this date in history. The 9th of May, 1961, FCC Chairman Newton Minow serves up a rec record-shattering understatement when he calls the boob tube a vast wasteland. Yes. And lastly, this date in history, the 9th of May, 1962, E.T. has a complete meltdown when some lab-coated hooligans on the rustic planet that they're orp, excuse me, orbiting bounce a laser beam off the moon. But did they? Inquiring minds would like to know. Once again, go on over to PIGazette.com, Free State of Pig. Those boys are always coming up with something. Um, apparently in Russia, Putin is working feverishly to return to the good old days of Cold War by putting the old Soviet Union Empire back together. Huh. That's just one little tidbit out of their top story. I remember over on the pig. So go on over and give them a shout. Tell them Grammy sent you. Um, do it hot. Uh, what? Vinny, my God. 
You just all over the place, darling. Well, okay. Um, let me check one more thing real fast, and then I really am. I'm going to get out of here. Just because, yeah, I think it would be wise. Let me see if this is... Okay, this is from Judson Singer over on uh, Geoengineering the Perpetrators on Facebook, Death of Trees, and it was contributed by a local resident who chooses anonymity. I'll do this real quick, and then I'm going to get out of here because it's rolling in. Um, I noticed dead trees everywhere along the road when I was driving back to Big Bear on Highway 38. I stopped at one of the campsites, holy shit, um, where I had been last year and noticed the rapid death of all of the pine trees. You could see through the trees to the sky with dead branches and hardly any pine needles on any of the trees. I've lived in Big Bear for the last 10 years and witnessed the rapid death of so many of the trees. Very concerned, I asked some of the rangers at the campsite why all the trees are dying. And she replied that some of it is due to drought. And I replied, but trees have withstood drought for hundreds of years and not died. Could it be what's being sprayed in the air? And they replied, yes, the aluminum, barium, and other nanoparticles the jets spray all day and night in the air for the geoengineering is killing all the birds and trees. And then, I then replied that when they spray, the aluminum and other nanoparticles get into the roots and kills the immune system of the trees to leave them open for parasites and diseases. And they replied, yes. Uh-oh. Did I lose? I did. I'm still on Spreaker, but... Uh, okay, Spreaker, I'm st I'm getting ready to drop off. So, um, I'm calling it a night, peeps. I'm not gonna go any further because yeah, it's it's kicking me off. Um. So. And I think Spreaker's still getting this. So, Grimmy, I will get to the blog and all that other fun stuff later. But for now, I'm going to get the heck out of here and shut down my computer so I don't lose it. So, thanks everybody for hanging out. Um, sorry I'm kick I'm sneaking out early. But, yeah, big bada boom and it's getting closer. So, I will catch up with you 